Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, I'd like to um, try and end up this week's lectures with a, a discussion about uh, allowed transitions, selection rules, and then finally uh, uh, how a laser operates. Uh, and uh, this discussion is going to be um, uh, at a slightly higher level than a lot of the uh, lectures that I've given in the course. I'm not going to work through a lot of the details, but um, you understand enough now if you've been paying attention to the previous lectures. You understand enough now that you should be able to appreciate uh, some of these uh, really interesting points that come out of uh, quantum mechanics. These are, these are uh, features that were not anticipated uh, when, when quantum mechanics was initially developed, but they've been uh, elaborated on and investigated over the years, and, and they're now part of the uh, uh, rich legacy that, that quantum mechanics has left to us. Um, to begin with, I like to, to uh, go through this qualitative discussion of what happens when an electromagnetic wave interacts with an atom. And this is something that everybody that takes this course should have a, 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 a firm understanding of. It uh, doesn't involve any mathematics. Uh, it, just under, it just requires you to understand what, what, what physically is happening. Um, the basic idea is that you've got an atom with an electron in some energy level E1, that atom, uh, the, the electron wave function for this energy level E1 is described by a wave function psi1. And if you um, then illuminate this atom by a, a stream of photons, right? Let's say we've got n photons striking this atom. Each photon has an electromagnetic uh, wave is represented by an electromagnetic wave, so there's an electric field vector E that varies in time, and, the, and it varies in time with an angular frequency, omega. Now what can happen is this electromagnetic wave can excite this atom and perturb this atom into some uh, ill-defined intermediate state, and this intermediate state is uh, basically a superposition of all possible quantum states of the system. Right, So for a short, very brief period of time, the atom doesn't know what quantum state it's in. But if this, this uh, energy of this incident photon happens to match uh, an energy difference between two uh, stationary states of, 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 a, of the electron in this hydrogen atom, then eventually this intermediate state quickly condenses. It, it, it settles down into a, an excited stationary state with energy E2, and the difference in the energy states E2 minus E1 is just given by h bar omega, where omega is the uh, time-dependent uh, uh, fre radial frequency uh, of the, um, I'm sorry, time-dependent angular frequency of the electric field E of the incident electromagnetic wave. So this is the uh, this is what happens to the atom. It settles down into another stationary state psi two. The photon field that passes through is now devoid of one photon because that photon has been used to promote the electron in the atom from energy level E1 to E2. Right? After a certain period of time, and the period of time is determined by Einstein's coefficient a sub 2, 1, after a certain period of time, this excited uh, atom with its electron and energy E2 decays back to the ground state. So the wave function psi 2 goes to psi 1, and uh, the electron then returns back to its ground state energy, and then the process of photon is emitted. So that one photon that was absorbed is then re-emitted in, uh, in, uh, at a later point in time. Now, how quickly this decay occurs depends strictly on the, the value for A sub 2, 1. And it's kind of interesting to ask, um, can quantum mechanics calculate A to 1 uh, from first principles? And the answer is it can. Uh, it depends on a long, complicated argument that um, that we're probably not going to have time to go through, but it's basically a time-dependent calculation. It involves Schrodinger's time-dependent wave wave equation, 
And in particular now, we've got to include a term uh, that describes the interaction of the electromagnetic wave with the atom, right? And um, it's the calculation or it's the, it's the formulation of this interaction term that's uh, uh, of interest in this lecture. Um, basically, you have to describe the radiation field, right? So typically the radiation field oscillates at some frequency, uh, angular frequency omega. There's a, the, the, the radiation field has a vector E field associated with it. You can convert this form of the radiation field, which is familiar from classical uh, electricity and magnetism. You can convert that to a more tractable form, which is uh, uh, by using uh, Euler's uh, uh, formula. And uh, you, you then have to ask the question, if a photon comes in that's characterized by an electric field that, that behaves like this, can that electric field excite an, uh, an electron in, a, in an atom? In other words, uh, what's the chances that the electric field of the photon can start to move an electron in the atom uh, in the same direction as the electric field that's imposed? And uh, that is the basis of this interaction term that goes into Schrodinger's equation. For the simple case that uh, is usually discussed in, in, in uh, many textbooks, uh, you just try to induce a dipole moment. Uh, you just basically try to displace the electron in the atom in the same direction as the electric field. And, and that displacement is then represented as the dot product between the electric field and the dipole moment that sets up in the atom. Uh, there's simple models for that. And uh, if you follow it through with, uh, let's say we just pretend that the, uh, the incident electromagnetic wave only has an electric field in the uh, Z direction, what I call the unit vector K direction, uh, then all possible motions of the uh, electron in the atom uh, the only ones of, that, that are of interest are the ones in the z direction because when you do this dot product, you just select out the z direction and that gives rise to this very simple form for the interaction uh, uh, term in the, in the, uh, uh, that goes into Schrodinger's equation. So if you put this, if you put this term back into Schrodinger's equation, you can actually work out and solve for uh, the um, the spontaneous emission rate A21 that Einstein defined in 1917. So Einstein defined this in 1917. Schrodinger's equation doesn't come along until like 1926. So it took something on the order of 10, 10 to 15 years before it was realized that this fundamental coefficient, that fundamental rate that Einstein defined just by thinking about the problem, that was that, that that thing could actually be related back to wave functions uh, that are that are known from solutions of Schrodinger's equation. So if you make a transition from let's say energy level E2 to energy level E1, energy level E2 is going to be specified by certain quantum numbers. Energy level E1 is going to be satisfied by certain quantum numbers. Those quantum numbers then allow you to specify the two wave functions, psi1 and psi2, that appear in this equation. And you can then use those wave functions with this interaction uh, uh, term uh, due to this dipole excitation to calculate the rate, the number per unit time, that uh, electrons will cascade from the upper level down to the lower level. So it's very interesting that sometimes, depending on what psi one and psi two are, are, are uh, uh, which psi one and psi two are selected, sometimes this the result of this integral is zero, right? And um, that just comes about because of the uh, the orthogonality of the wave functions. Sometimes the uh, wave functions, uh, when multiplied against one another and integrated, turn out to have a, a zero answer. And so this gives rise to this idea of selection rules uh, that make A21 non-zero in general. And so there are a variety of selection rules that have been discovered. And I'd like to focus on just the one, the most general one, which says that uh, you can only make transitions from energy levels two to energy levels one, provided the, uh, the, uh, 
the, the quantum number script L changes by plus or minus one, right? So this, this gives rise to allowed transitions in atomic hydrogen. Uh, for instance, uh, what I've done here is I've listed the, the various energy levels and I've shown the degeneracy of the different energy levels depending on the uh, principal quantum number n, right? Because of this selection rule that this script L has to change by plus or minus one, some of these, uh, these transitions are forbidden. So for instance, you cannot go from a 2s level to a 1s level because uh, if you did, this, this, uh, uh, the, the, the value of script L is equal to zero. The change in the value of script L is equal to zero. So that would make the transition matrix element A21 equal to zero. So instead, if you want to go from the n equals 2 to the n equals 1 level, you've got to go from a 2p to a 1s, right? So there are a few forbidden transitions that, uh, that are predicted by this uh, calculation. Um, and I wouldn't be up here talking about it if, if these predictions uh, were not tested experimentally. And uh, not only are the uh, forbidden uh, transitions not observed in the atomic spectrum of hydrogen, right? But the rate constants, A sub 2, 1, that are calculated from the previous slide, that also agrees uh, very well with uh, these these various transitions. So all, all that has been investigated and uh, everything checks out very nicely. So it's a, um, it was a, a unintended consequence almost of the fact uh, that uh, when A21 was first introduced, there was no fundamental understanding of what it came from or what, what controlled it. But, uh, you know, with time, uh, these, these equations were worked out and everything uh, was then able to be checked in more detail. Uh, another important implication is that um, if, if script L is changing uh, by plus minus one, right, that means that change in script L cannot equal to zero. And since script L gives you some information about the uh, angular momentum of the electron in the uh, uh, hydrogen atom, that implies that these photons that are emitted must carry away angular momentum for, for angular momentum conservation to apply. So the argument is since delta L has got to change by plus minus one, when an electron goes from one energy level to another energy level, there's a change in the angular momentum of the electron. What carries away that angular momentum? Well, it's got to be the photon. And so now there's, there's this general appreciation that photons, uh, can be, uh, can carry angular momentum, which is either right-handed or left-handed. So there are two types of photons. They have different, uh, angular momentum associated with them. And that again is a consequence of, 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 of these, uh, uh, selection rules that come out of, of uh, calculating the, uh, the uh, transition rate for spontaneous emission, this A sub 2, 1. Um, um, almost from the uh, start, uh, this stimulated uh, process, the stimulated emission process that Einstein proposed uh, attracted a lot of attention because it was pretty clear that uh, the implication of it was that you could amplify light, right? You could put one photon into a system and you could get two photons out. Um, and so the quest, quest uh, started for how to control, how to demonstrate this stimulated emission. And it became clear, reasonably clear, that uh, light that was produced by a stimulated emission process would have completely different characteristics from light that's produced by a non-stimulated emission process. And I try to illustrate that here qualitatively. Uh, it's the difference between light from a flashlight, which uh, spreads out and diverges and contains different colors of wavelengths, uh, different polarizations. Uh, there's no coherence between the light emitted uh, from one region of the filament in the light bulb with respect to light emitted from another region of a filament from the light bulb. Compare that to a laser where all the photons are going to be synchronized because they're all emitted due to this stimulated emission process. 
So the question is, could you actually produce uh, some of these, um, uh, uh, I mean, what experimentally do you need to do to produce this, uh, this stimulated emission? And uh, of course, it requires a, a, a very deep understanding of these three key processes that Einstein proposed in 1917, right? And um, the way it works is, um, the way it was finally made to work, I've, I've tried to indicate schematically in this slide, it actually revol revolves around a three-state system. So um, you have three energy levels, E1, E2, and E3. This energy level E3 is particularly long-lived compared to the energy level E2. So that's a key, uh, key result that, that was uh, 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 imposed in order to, to uh, uh, produce a laser. Uh, this, this energy level E3 is referred to as a metastable state because it's not quite stable, but it's, it's almost stable. And uh, the way it works is you, um, you, uh, you basically have to excite electrons from energy uh, or atoms from energy level E1 up to energy level E2. And the uh, initial, Im uh, and the initial uh, um, implementation of a laser, that was done by using an intense flashlight that was flashed onto a collection of, of gas atoms. So in this example, I just consider eight atoms just to, just to be specific. Uh, uh, this intense flashlight will cause a large uh, upward uh, transition of atoms into this energy level E2. These uh, atoms in energy level E2 then very quickly decay into this metastable state uh, uh, E3. This decay from energy level E2 to E3 is going to be governed by Einstein's coefficient A sub 2, 3 that describes these two, these two quantum states. So whatever, whatever the wave functions are for these two quantum states, you can use those wave functions to calculate A sub 2, 3. Um, the key point is that the atoms accumulate in this energy level E3 because it's a metastable state. The time it takes for this state to decay back to the ground state is very long compared to the time it takes for the electrons to decay from E2 to E3. So what you do is you, you obtain a population inversion where you accumulate a large number of atoms in energy level E3. And then what you do is you, you rely on some random photon to come through. Uh, this photon then stimulates uh, photon emission uh, and it basically depopulates energy, e le energy level E3 in a, in a very rapid fashion and it generates this, uh, this intense beam of light which is collimated, monochromatic, and all synchronized in phase. So um, that, was, that, that was the uh, insight that, that that sort of drove research for about 50 years, right? For about 50 years. So I always like to point out the timelines on these, on these issues, right? I mean, Einstein proposed this stimulated emission process in 1917. Um, it started a quest uh, to, to, uh, to actually demonstrate it experimentally. It took about 43 years. In 1960, the visible laser was uh, was invented and published, uh, uh, demonstrated by Maimon, um, and uh, it, uh, the rest is history, right? I mean, lasers are now uh, everywhere in, in uh, all forms of technology uh, throughout the world. Um, this process of stimulated emission uh, is very nicely illustrated on the web by a laser simulator. So if you go to this website, you can, you can basically uh, uh, control and uh, this this whole process right by adjusting photon energies and flash lamp energies and so on and so forth and you can actually demonstrate laser emission so the the simulation captures all the dynamics of this three state system that we've discussed and, and allows you to to fool around uh, uh, and try to get a better understanding of this problem um, I just wanted to end the lecture by saying, you know, the, uh, the I just have a simple laser pointer, right? And the ability to uh, 
to uh, position this laser pointer and 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 use it um, is uh, routine today, but uh, 50 years ago or so, it was rather remarkable. Um, I can remember when I first saw a laser. This was in the mid 1960s. So the laser was invented in 19. The, the visible laser was invented in 1960. By about 1965, uh, it was possible to commercially buy these lasers, and the impact they had on research was just phenomenal. Uh, I can remember um, there was a research group in the university that I was studying who managed to get money to buy one of these optical lasers. Uh, they used these optical lasers to transmit laser beams down hallways at night. Uh, and it was uh, just a phenomenal um, event to occur, to, to observe, to see this laser beam traveling, let's say, 50 yards with zero divergence and it would end up on a screen as a, as a small bright dot, right? And uh, um, that was something that um, just, just uh, created a, a, a memory for me that I'll never forget. So uh, that, was, that was about 50 years ago. Uh, nowadays they're everywhere, they're routine, they're not so surprising, but uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing, uh, amazing uh, demonstration of how uh, some of these very simplistic ideas that are introduced into science actually work their way into technology. It seems that the time scale takes on the order of 40 to 50 years, so you have to be very patient. Um, so uh, this ends a discussion of uh, optical transitions and photons uh, for this course. Uh, we're going to move on to one final topic, um, uh, which we'll uh, discuss in next week's lectures. This final topic uh, is about the, uh, uh, the magnetism that uh, individual atoms can uh, acquire. And in the process of trying to measure the magnetism uh, uh, associated with an individual atom, we're going to uncover the fact that electrons actually have an intrinsic spin and actually have an intrinsic magnetic moment. Uh, and so we'll introduce the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, quantum spin, and that will then end our discussion for uh, 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 quantum, quantum states of electrons and atoms. So come on back next week. We'll, the, the discussion will be a little bit more simple than it was this week. Uh, and we'll focus on uh, the spin of an electron. So we'll see you then.